Well, good evening to you all. If you take your Bibles, turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read there in just one second. I just want to say really quick that I, I really appreciate all the young men that we have lead our service. I really appreciate the growth that we've seen uh, in Dugray Hilt. He is just a fantastic song leader. And uh, if you've never led singing before, you're not aware of just how difficult it is to lead an unfamiliar song to so many people. And he just did a fantastic job doing that. We really, really appreciate that. Before we begin this evening, there are a couple things I want to draw your attention to, specifically in your, in your family report. I want to let you know that uh, we mentioned this, this this morning in the family report, that on March 8th, that is two Sundays from today, not next Sunday, but the one after that, we're going to have our Invite a Friend Sunday. And that's going, to be, that's going to be a Sunday morning where we try to focus our attention on helping and uh, dedicating ourselves to the visitors that will be in our midst. So it's a wonderful opportunity to, for you to reach out to that person you work with, that person you go to school with, and invite them to come to services. We're going we're gonna to tailor make this service so that it will be beneficial, especially to our visitors. So please, Pick up some handouts and pick out some uh, invite a friend cards in the back. They're under the monitors in the foyer. Please invite somebody to that. You never know the difference that you can make in somebody's life with a simple invitation. We also mentioned in the family report that this week, this past week, our sister Hazel Wood passed away. I was given a note to read to you guys uh, from the Littell family, and I'm going to do that right now. It says, you are all aware that Hazel Wood passed last week. The funeral will be in Indiana, March 14th, 2020, at the Charleston Road Church of Christ at 1 p.m. Phyllis has prepared a written memorial of her life and wishes to share that with anyone. The pamphlets are available under the picture board in the back after services. We wish to thank everyone for their calls, cards, and for the beautiful flowers sent. Thank you for those who have visited with her and been so kind to her. It is a blessing to be a part of such a loving church family. Phyllis and Dan Littell. So please, if you want to have that, uh, that pamphlet about the life of Miss Phyllis, it is a wonderful little pamphlet, that, uh, the life of Miss Hazel. Sorry about that. Uh, it is a wonderful pamphlet that Phyllis put together. Uh, and thank you so much for being there for the Littell family during this trying time. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14, the Bible says this, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. It was on November 17th of last year that I preached a sermon called, What Silence Says. You may recognize the, the slide on the back, right? And we began with the exact same verse, the verse where, where uh, Paul tells Timothy that the local church is, is the household of God, and that there is a way that one is to conduct themselves within the household of God. And during that study last year on November 17th, we made the point that God's silence means something to us. That just because God hasn't explicitly condemned something in the Scripture doesn't mean that we have the right to just go and do whatever we want to do. One example that we used in that study I think was especially helpful. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read about how, how David decides in his own heart that he wants to build a temple for God, Right? But the Lord has not told him that he wants David to build a temple. And so the word of the Lord comes to David, and he is told this in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 7, Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And so in that, in, that, in that example, God tells David, I don't want you to build me a house. And if I would have wanted you to build me a house, I would have done what? I would have asked for it. And so what we covered in that lesson is that God's, God's silence means something. That if God wants something from us, He will ask for it. And that if God has not asked for something, that means He does not want it. 
And that lesson, I think, is, is pretty simple. But there's another question that I think naturally flows from that discussion that I think it's important for us to discuss. There is, a, there is a question that follows on the heels of that, that some people, some people who worship in a church like this may be asking themselves, look, I understand that we shouldn't violate the silence of God, and I understand that we shouldn't give God things that He hasn't asked for. But are we sure that here at the Temple Terrace Church of Christ, we aren't violating the silence of God? Are we sure that we are truly respecting His silence? Because the truth is, brothers and sisters, if you look around the room that we're in, you're going to see some things, you're going to see some things that we have that God hasn't really said anything about in the Bible, right? Do Gray asked you to pull out your songbook, right? God doesn't say anything about songbooks in the Bible, does He? Nor does He say anything about projectors or baptistries or pews or even, even a church building. Who said that we can have a church building? God is silent about those things, isn't He? And so if we have these things, are we as a church, as the household of God, disrespecting the silence of God? That's the question I'd like to tackle with you this evening, because I believe that's, that's extremely important. And I'll tell you, the temptation for, for some people, the temptation for me maybe, if I was sitting in this audience listening to someone else preach this sermon, the temptation is for us to look at that question and say, well, that's just silly, and kind of slough it off, right? Of course we can have a church building. Of course we can have songbooks. It's kind of silly to question whether or not that's true. But I think that would be a mistake for two reasons. Number one, if we do not have a clear and thorough answer to questions like that, then our faith, our conviction about what we do and whether or not it's right, it does not rest on the Word of God or on the truth. It really just rests on our traditions, which if you ask the Pharisees, is a dangerous place to be. And secondly, I think that's dangerous to just slough this question off because because some people have used that exact same line of thought to justify violating the silence of God. There is a, there's a very, very popular YouTube video called Chairs. Anybody ever seen that YouTube video, Chairs? Where a preacher basically does exactly that. I'm going to try not to straw man his argument. I didn't watch it, but I remember that basically his point is, this group of people says... That's ridiculous. And so this group of people says, uh, we can't do this. And this group of people says, we can't do that. And basically his point is, every church does something that God doesn't really talk about. And so basically, pretty much everything is okay. Right? We all in some way violate the silence of God. And so we should be able to justify doing just about anything. And so one person says, well, we shouldn't use the church. We shouldn't use the church's funds to build a theme park for Jesus because the Bible, Bible doesn't say anything about that. And then somebody comes along behind him and says, well, the, the Bible doesn't say anything about songbooks either, so I guess we can do just whatever we want to do. So I, wanna, I, I want you to see that this is an important question for us to consider. That in this church, are we really, are we really respecting the silence of God? And so tonight, I'd like to spend a few more minutes discussing the silence of God. And we're going to call this sermon, we're going to call this lesson, Limits and Liberties, because answering that question, are we really, are we really honoring the silence of God, rests on understanding a fundamental principle. And that principle is this, that commands, commands have both limits and liberties, okay? Do you all understand that? Commands have both limits and liberties within them. And let me explain what I mean by that. Every command has limits. And that means there are choices that have been made that I must honor. When I'm given a command, there are choices that have been made that if I'm going to be obedient, I must honor those choices. For example, let me, let me give this to you. What if, what if you, sorry, that's too early. What if, let's say you're a recent college graduate, 
and you just started a brand new job, right? You are, you are I don't know, the, you, you became the assistant to the regional manager of some, of some company here in Tampa, okay? And, and one day, at right around the first week of your work, you walk in and you see, you see this note left on your desk. It says, bring me a Starbucks white chocolate mocha latte to my office at 10.30 a.m. today, boss. You know, when you move to Tampa, you get notes like that from your boss. <laughs> understand, understand that that command has limits, doesn't it? Your boss has specified some things. There are sp some specific things that you have to honor if you are going to be obedient, right? It's got to be Starbucks. It can't be Dunkin' Donuts. That's not good enough. And it's got to be a white chocolate mocha latte. You can't, bring them, you can't bring them a black coffee and then be okay with it. And you have to deliver it to the right place, his office. You have to deliver it at the right time as well. And to emphasize the point we made last year when we talked about this, you can't bring him cake pops too. There are some specific things that have been laid out that you have to honor if you are going to be obedient. Every command has limits. And I think that's something that we understand pretty readily. That makes a lot of sense to us. But, but we also have to appreciate, and we don't always understand this quite as well, that every command also has liberties within it. And by that I mean that there are choices that I have to make that haven't already been made. There are choices that I'm going to have to make when I'm fulfilling this command because my boss hasn't already made them for me, right? And you're looking at that, that example up there, and everybody knows, everybody knows there is one very important piece of information that my boss has not specified, right? When I go and I go to pick up his coffee, there's a question, there's a choice that I'm going to have to make using my best judgment. What is that? Size, Right? I'm going to have to decide what size coffee to get because he did not specify what size to get. And so in that situation, I have the liberty to use my best judgment to decide what size coffee would be best. And not only, not only the liberty, right, but the obligation. Because if I, if I sit there and I say, I say I'm not going to choose a size because my boss didn't tell me to choose a size. If I sit there and say, I will not choose a size, I'm never going to be able to fulfill the command. That barista is going to be sitting there staring at me with a blank stare, right? Because I need to choose a size. Not only do I have the liberty to decide, but I have the obligation. That the only way I can fulfill this command is if I use my best judgment to make this decision. And so understand that when we talk about the liberties within a command, we're not talking about running off and getting myself involved in something that my boss didn't ask for. Instead, we're talking about, we're talking about how do I accomplish what God or my boss has asked me to do when he hasn't been specific. Does that make sense? We're not talking about bringing your boss a steak when he asks for a coffee. We're talking about you choosing what size coffee to bring when he didn't specifically tell you. And so that's the fundamental principle that we have to appreciate. That within a command, there are both limits and liberties. And here's what I want you to understand. That within a command, within a command, you have the liberty to choose what you think is best, so long as you honor the limits of the command. What I'd like to do now is I want to show you that that's not just something that I made up. What I want to show you is, is a good example of that that you see in your Bible. This is what we see in the Word of God. This is what we see from God's people when they are fulfilling His commands and honoring His Word. What we see is that we have the liberty to choose how to fulfill commands so long as we honor the limits of the command. And if I can take you back to that story that we began with, the story of the construction of Solomon's temple. 
I contend that this is exactly what we see in this story. That regarding the temple that Solomon was going to build, there were, there were limits that could not be violated. There were limits, commands that had to be honored. But there were also decisions where Solomon had to use his best judgment because God had not been specific. And so I want to show you this. You'll remember what we said at the beginning with re- regarding Solomon's temple. That the first idea... The first idea for, for building this temple was not in the heart of Solomon. It was in the heart of his father, David. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David, uh, God tells David, I don't want you to build this temple for me. I want a temple, but I don't want you to build it. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, God tells David this. It says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so I, what I want you to see is that David, David wanted to build this temple, but God put a limit on that building project, right? God said, I don't want you to build it. I have a specific person in mind. And that person is going to be David's son, Solomon. But that's not the only thing we see. We see, also, we see also that God had a specific plan for this temple. If you advance the story, if you advance the story to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 11, that in, at that time David is older. David is older and Solomon is now growing into a man. And in chapter 28, David addresses an assembly of officials and princes and commanders. And at that time, he says... He says this, or the Bible tells us this, Then David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch of the temple, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat. And you look at the rest of the verses, we don't have time, we don't have a a space to put them on the board, right? And you would be really bored because he tells all the way down into verse verse 18, he's talking about all the specific details of this plan that David gave to his son Solomon. Solomon. And then in verse 19, it tells us this. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. So what I want you to see is that when Solomon went about building the temple, God had a specific plan in mind. There was a specific way it was going to work. There were going to be specific pieces of furniture within it. God had a specific plan, a very detailed plan for the temple. And not only a plan, but he also had a specific place in mind. After Solomon builds the temple, he stands up before the people and he addresses them as they are dedicating the temple to God. And he says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 6, uh, that, 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 that God said this to Solomon, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And so what I want you to see is that there is another limit that God put on this building project. He has a specific person in mind, a specific plan in mind, and a specific place in mind. This temple is going to be built where? It's going to be built in Jerusalem, which means that when Solomon goes about building it, he can't build it in Dan or in Bethel or in Philistia. He's going to build it in Jerusalem. And not only, not only does God have a person and a plan and a place in mind, but he also, has, he also has a specific purpose in mind. In 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 4, the Bible says about this temple that it will be to burn fragrant incense before him and set out the showbread continually. Right, in 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 4, we're told that this, this temple is going to be dedicated to the Lord, that this temple is going to have a specific purpose. It is going to be to burn fragrant incense before Him, to set out the showbread continually. If you look further in that same verse, it says it will be to offer burnt offerings. In other words, this temple is not a YMCA. This temple is not a civic center. This temple is not a multi-purpose facility that, 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 that Israel can use however they want want, right? It has a specific purpose. It is dedicated to the service and the worship of God. In fact, if you want another argument for silence, if you look at Matthew 22 and verse 13, that's exactly why Jesus gets so upset when he sees the temple. 
Because it was meant to be a house of prayer. But it became a den of robbers. But I want you to see that Solomon's temple had several specific limits. Several things that God specifically said he wanted. A specific person, a plan, a place, and a purpose. And it's obvious. It's obvious to you and to me that if Solomon decides to do any of those things differently, he becomes disobedient, doesn't he? But I believe it's also clear that if you read that story, that within those limits there are liberties. There are things about which God has not been specific. There are choices that Solomon is going to have to make and use his best judgment because God did not give him a specific command regarding it. Right? God has given him the who and the what and the why and the where. But the Lord, the Lord has not given him the how, has he? And so what you see when you read this story is that God does not give Solomon a limit about the specific procedure. He doesn't tell him exactly how this whole project is supposed to come together. And so Solomon has both the liberty and the obligation when it comes to building God's temple to make some decisions for himself. And you see in his story, that's exactly what he does. In 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 2 and verses 1 through 2, the Bible tells us, So Solomon assigned 70,000 men to carry loads, and 80,000 men to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 men to supervise them. Notice that God did not tell him to do that. He didn't tell him to assign stone carriers or men supervising the stone carriers. But, but if the temple's going to get built, someone's got to carry the stones to the place. And we look in 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 3, the Bible says this, Then Solomon sent word to Hiram, the king of Tyre, saying, As you dealt with David my father, and send him cedars to build him a house to dwell in, so do for me. If Solomon's going to complete this temple, he needs wood. But God didn't give him a specific instruction on how he was supposed to get that wood. And so Solomon uses his best judgment to accomplish the commands of God. He reaches out to the king of Tyre, and he makes a deal with him to supply the wood for building the temple. In building this temple, Solomon also needs a skilled craftsman. He is not a carpenter. He's not a metallurgist. But the temple plans that God has given him require some some pretty intricate work. It requires the work of somebody who is very skillful and very talented. And so Solomon, Solomon has to use his best judgment in how he's going to get that done. And so in 2 Chronicles 2 and verse 7, he sends this to to the king of Tyre as well. He says this, Now send me a skilled man to work in gold, silver, brass, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and violet fabrics, and who knows how to make engravings. To work with the skilled men whom I have in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David, my father, provided. And so he sends to the kingdom of Tyre, and he asks, I need a really, really talented guy. Because I need help being able to do this. He uses his best judgment where God has not been specific so that he can accomplish the commands of God. And so understand that when we look at all this, brothers and sisters, Solomon isn't violating the silence of God. He's not running off and giving God something he didn't ask for. Solomon is trying to fulfill the command of God. But in order to obey God, he has to make some choices. He has to use his best judgment because God wasn't specific in those areas. And so I think this is what Solomon shows us. That when God gives us a command... We have the liberty to choose for ourselves the best way to accomplish that command so long as we honor the limits of the command. Can I say that again? Did that make sense? When God gives us a command, we have the liberty to choose for ourselves the best way to accomplish that command so long as we honor the limits of the command. Or maybe to put it in in a different vernacular We have the liberty to choose the size of the latte. Because God hasn't been specific. Now quickly, as we we bring this lesson to a close, 
Let's bring this all the way home into the 21st century and see if we can, see if we can apply it to the world we live in and, and, and our work as the household of God today. You know, you look around in this room and you see a lot of things. You see a lot of things that God has not specifically commanded us to use. But the question isn't really whether or not God has said anything about it. In fact, there are two fundamental questions, two fundamental questions that I think serve as a great filter for us in all that we do as a church. And those questions are this, are these. Number one, are we striving to fulfill a command of God with this thing that we're using? Are we striving to fulfill a command of God? And number two, do these things honor the limits within the command that God has given us? Every command has limits and liberties, and we have the liberty to choose for ourselves the best way to accomplish God's command, so long as we honor the limits. And so those are the two questions that we need to ask ourselves. When we have something, when we're using something, are we, are we using this thing because we are really trying to accomplish a command that God gave us? And in using this thing, are we violating any of the limits He has laid down within that command? And you know, there, there are a lot of directions we could go from here. There are a lot of different things we could talk about. But for the sake of time, I just want to look at one example. Just one example before we bring this lesson to the close. And this, this example really is, is the sticking point for a lot of people. I want you to think about the example of this church building as a whole. Because a lot of people who might, say, who might say that this church is violating the silence of God might look at this building and say, look, God doesn't say anything about building a structure like a church building to worship in. And so this church is violating the silence of God. We are not giving him what he wants because we built a church building and he didn't say anything about it. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, does this building violate the silence of God? Well, let's run that through the filter of these two questions. What's that first question? In building this building, in using this church building, are we striving? Are we striving to fulfill a command that God has given to us? And the answer to that is yes, right? In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Bible tells us, the Bible commands Christians that we are not to forsake our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God tells us as Christians, as the New Testament church, I want you to assemble together. I want you to meet together. I want you to worship together and partake of the Lord's Supper together. I want you to assemble. And so if you asked any of the elders of this church, why do we have a church building? They would tell you it's because God commanded us to assemble together and we're trying to fulfill that command. This, this is where we assemble. We're striving to follow the commands of God. Now let's run that through the second question. Does building a church building honor the limits of the command to assemble? Have we violated any of the limits that God has set down about this assembly? And you know, if you think about it, you read your Bible, you, you, you quickly find out that when it comes to an assembly like this, there are a lot of limits, a lot of limits that God has placed on an assembly like this. There are limits on what we should do, right? On how we should worship Him and the things we should involve ourselves in. There are limits on who should do what, right? You read that all over the place in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There are limits on how things should be done. But what I want you to see, brothers and sisters, is that when it comes to the assembly of the saints, there are no limits that God has placed on where we are to assemble. No limits whatsoever. Now, somebody in this audience is thinking to themselves, well, Jonathan, actually there are. Because when you open up the New Testament and you read about the New Testament church, guess what you find? You read that there was a, a, a pattern established by them, right? The New Testament church, they all met where? In each other's homes, right? 
And so shouldn't we do that? That's the pattern laid down for us. They met in each other's homes, and so that's what we should do too, because that's the pattern. Actually, not at all, okay? Sorry, but uh, one of my biggest pet peeves in the world, when somebody says, oh, the first century church, they just met in each other's homes, you just look at them and say, actually not. That is not true at all. Let me show this to you. Let me show this to you. Acts chapter 5 and verse 12. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord where? In Solomon's portico. You know where the first church met? Inside the temple we just talked about. You know where else they met? In Acts 22 and verse 19, Paul says this. He says, And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. Now, Paul, Paul is saying in Acts 22 in verse 19, he's saying that he used to go persecute Christians. Do you notice in that verse where he found them? In synagogues, right? They used the old Jewish synagogues to meet together. Not just one another's homes. Acts 26, 11, you see that again. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. You see multiple times in the book of Acts, where are Christians meeting? Not in each other's homes. They're meeting in the temple. They're meeting in the old Jewish synagogues. And also they are. They are meeting in each other's homes in different areas. In Acts 20 and verse 8, it tells us it tells us that there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. We know they also gathered in that upper room. I don't know what that was. It may have been someone's house. It may have been some kind of community facility. I don't know what it was. But this is the point, brothers and sisters. When you open up the book and you read, you see very clearly that Christians met all over the place. That God didn't really care where they met. He just cared that they met. And so therefore we can conclude that God has left us with the liberty to decide, to use our best judgment on what is the best place for this church to assemble. I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, that as a church we have the liberty to choose the best way to accomplish God's command so long as we honor the limits within His command. And I believe that as we do all these things as the household of God, those two questions, those two fundamental questions are what we should continue asking ourselves to see whether or not we truly are honoring God as the Lord of this house. All these things that I'm doing, are we striving to do what God has asked for? Are we striving to fulfill a command of God? And as we do those things, are we honoring the limits He's given us within those commands? Perhaps better stated, are we bringing God a steak when He asked for coffee? Or are we simply choosing a size when He hasn't been specific? I think with those questions and with an honest heart, we can truly, as the household of God, give Him Give him what he deserves. And remember that as God's household, that is what we're striving for. We're striving to give him what he deserves. And that means honoring his silence as we talked about last year. We, uh, that, that means not going off and getting ourselves involved in things that he never told us to get involved in. And it also means exercising our wisdom and our liberties to accomplish the will of God as best we possibly can when he hasn't been specific. Let us do all we can as the household of God to honor Him as the Lord of the house. The Bible also teaches us there is a pattern for the New Testament church. There's also a pattern, a pattern for how we are to be saved. There's a way that God told us to do that. And that is that if we, if we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we're willing to repent of our sins and confess our belief before men, then we need to be baptized in water to have our sins washed away. That is the pattern. That's how we're added to the household of God. So if you need to honor Him in that right now, or if we can help you in another way, please come to the front and make it known while we stand and while we sing.